Hey friends, it's Masood. Welcome back to Med School Moose. This video is going to be USMLE Step 3, High Yield Facts Part 3. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch Parts 1 and 2 right now. If you haven't, I will be sure to link Part 1 right here. And as always, be sure to subscribe to receive all of my latest content and all of my High Yield videos to help you prepare for your board exams. Real quick before we get started, if you are planning on taking USMLE Step 3 and you're looking for some additional resources, look no further than Online MedEd. Online MedEd has been around for years. They've actually been around since I was a medical student and I used their resources, which were amazing, and they've continued to build their library and improve upon that. They do have USMLE Step 3 resources, including a question bank with amazing expertly curated questions, some whiteboard videos that break down a lot of the complex topics for Step 3, as well as additional notes and audio. And if you're a student planning on taking comics level three they also have dedicated omm modules so be sure to check them out i'll put a link in the description below use promo code moose 25 for 25 percent off of an online med ed subscription thank you so much to online med ed for this amazing discount now let's go ahead and get to those high yield facts Here's the first one. What is the most accurate test for the diagnosis of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome? Remember, I feel like I'm saying it every video. You really want to make sure that you're reading these questions slowly, making sure you're understanding what they're asking for. The most accurate test, the most sensitive test, the most specific test, the gold standard of diagnosis, that kind of thing. So the most accurate test for diagnosis of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is going to be a secretin suppression test. Remember, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, also known as an, a gastrinoma, leads to elevated levels of gastrin and gastric acid output. So the most accurate test to diagnose that is going to be a secretin suppression test. What is the best initial therapy for C. difficile colitis? Again, best initial therapy. We want to be starting off with oral vancomycin. This is generally the first line therapy. Some patients may receive oral fidaxomycin. Some patients who have recurrent C. diff colitis may get something even beyond that, like a fecal transplant. But generally, the best initial therapy is oral vancomycin. What is the most common cause of death in GI bleeding? This is actually going to be due to myocardial ischemia. This is a little bit of a tricky question. If you've been in the hospital and taking care of some geriatric patients, you'll see that some of these elderly patients, they may have a really slow GI bleed. They're not going to bleed to death, right? They have a, a slow GI bleed that drops their hemoglobin over the course of several months. So death doesn't occur by bleeding out or exsanguination per se. The most common cause of death is actually due to myocardial ischemia. So be sure that you know that. What is the most accurate test for the diagnosis of rhabdomyolysis? it's actually going to be a urine myoglobin level. In the real world, we do use some other serum markers like a CK or a CPK from the blood, but the most accurate test for diagnosis is actually going to be urine myoglobin to detect the breakdown of that protein, that myoglobin in the urine sample. What are some causes of hypomagnesemia? A little bit of a broad question, but these are still some important things that we need to know. So causes of hypomagnesemia are things like diuretic use, alcohol use, and starvation, as well as chemotherapy. An important thing to note here, especially for alcohol use, remember patients with chronic alcohol use have really poor nutrition. So they may also be deficient in thiamine, folic acid, as well as magnesium, which is why we frequently supplement these vitamins and minerals when these alcoholic patients are admitted to the hospital. But be sure to know all of these causes of hypomagnesemia. Which type of renal tubular acidosis is characterized by hyperkalemia? This is going to be type 4. Remember, type 4 renal tubular acidosis is characterized by decreased aldosterone production or the effectiveness of aldosterone, and as a result, patients will have hyperkalemia. At what age should screening for hyperlipidemia begin? This is typically going to be in men over 35 years old and in women over 45 years old. Remember, for step three, for complex level three, preventative medicine is important, so you really need to know all the guidelines for screening, all of these USPSTF recommendations, these things are very, very important for level three and step three. In that same note, how frequently should a booster of tetanus vaccine be given? Generally, this is going to be once every 10 years. Anyone who's rotated through the emergency department, works in the emergency department, knows that we're giving tetanus boosters all the time. So for the most part, a booster of tetanus vaccine should be given once every 10 years. Moving on now, at what age should patients receive the Zoster vaccine? So again, more of this preventative medicine, vaccination schedules, that kind of thing. Zoster vaccine should be administered in patients who are over 50. Remember, this Zoster vaccine is going to prevent against the reactivation of the varicella Zoster virus. It's going to hopefully prevent shingles in those elderly patients, which if you've ever seen that can be very uncomfortable, very painful for these patients, which is why we want to make sure they're getting that vaccine. What are the criteria to perform routine diabetes screening? So routine diabetes screening is going to be in patients with hypertension or obesity. 
obesity. These are significant comorbidities that are associated with an increased risk of diabetes. So patients that have these comorbidities, hypertension or obesity, that is the criteria to perform routine diabetes screening. What is the mortality rate of Stevens-Johnson syndrome? This is actually going to be somewhere around less than 5 to 10%. Remember, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is a hypersensitivity to various drugs. It involves about 10 to 15% of the total body surface area. And as a result, the course is generally a little bit more mild. So the mortality rate is less, somewhere around 5 to 10%, if not a little bit less than that. On the other hand, what is the mortality rate of toxic epidermal necrolysis? Now, this tends to be more severe. The total body surface area affected is anywhere from 30 to 100%. And as a result, it's going to have a higher mortality rate, somewhere around 40 to 50%. So be sure you know those mortality rates. Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis exist on a spectrum. And because of that, the mortality rates, the affected area varies greatly. Moving on now, what is the treatment of stasis dermatitis? This is actually going to be a few different things that we can do. Elevate Elevation of the legs is an easy one, and then lower extremity compression with things like compression stockings. This is something that affects elderly patients, those sedentary patients, those with obesity, that kind of thing. So there are some simple interventions that can be taken here to help treat that. Steroids may be effective in some cases, but for the most part, stasis dermatitis, we're treating that with leg elevation and compression stockings to really compress those lower extremities. What is the most common cause of colonic perforation in the elderly? This is actually going to be diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is fairly common common in the elderly. Remember, it presents with that left lower quadrant abdominal pain typically can cause some bloody stool, bloody diarrhea as well. And if it is severe enough, it can cause microperforation or full-on colonic perforation, especially in those elderly patients. So be sure that you know that. More perforation, what is the most common cause of esophageal perforation? This one's actually a little bit of a trick question too, but it's going to be iatrogenic. The classic scenario is after an endoscopy following esophageal dilation, that is actually the most common cause of esophageal perforation, so that's important to know. At what ejection fraction is a patient considered at high cardiac risk for surgery? This is generally going to be less than 35% ejection fraction. Of course, this is on a case-by-case -case basis, but the reason that all of these preoperative patients have to get some type of cardiac workup, frequently get an echo, is to check their ejection fraction because if they do have a history of heart failure or they do have a severely reduced ejection fraction, they are very high cardiac risk for surgery. What is the most accurate test for diagnosis of Fournier's gangrene? This is actually going to be a CT scan. Remember, Fournier Fournier's gangrene is a necrotizing soft tissue infection in the perineum. It will show with air along the fascial planes or deep tissue involvement, and that is why it is so, so important to look in the groin for patients that are coming in with a rash or fever, obese patients, that kind of thing. You want to make sure that you're looking in the groin so that there's not any signs of a necrotizing infection like Fournier's gangrene. A bit of an odd question here, but still important to know, what is the most common joint abnormality? This is actually going to be osteoarthritis. Is cardiac output high or low in septic shock? Cardiac output tends to be high. This is typically due to an elevated heart rate. Remember, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. If you have a patient that's in septic shock, that's fighting an infection, they tend to have tachycardia. So they're increasing that heart rate. And as a result, they're going to have an increased cardiac output. Loss of the P wave and widening of the QRS complex on ECG is concerning for blank. This is going to be concerning for hyperkalemia. Okay, very important to know anyone who's in emergency medicine, this is our bread and butter. Loss of the P wave, widening of the QRS complex, also peaked T waves. These are all things that are very concerning for hyperkalemia. So if you see this on an EKG on a patient, especially a dialysis patient, something like that, you want to make sure that you're getting some blood work and checking that potassium level. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you got value out of this video, be sure to drop me a like down below. Click here on the left for USMLE Step 3 High Yield Facts Part 1 and click here on the right for another video that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Be sure to subscribe and I will catch you in the next one.